The Dragon Pack Series by Timothy Zahn. Book 6. Dragon and Liberator. Chapter 1. One month. The words echoed through Dracos' mind as he lay in his two-dimensional form against Jack Morgan's back, arms, and legs. One month. One month left until the refugee fleet carrying the remainder of his Kadah people and their Shantine symbionts arrived here in the Orion arm of the Milky Way galaxy. One month until their long, wearying journey would be over. One month until they flew into the ambush that Arthur Neverlin and the Valaga were preparing for them. Or perhaps even less than that. After two years in hyperspace, they could easily be a week or two early for their rendezvous. Dracos raised his head a little from Jack's shoulder, his eyebrow ridges and spiny crest pressing up against the boy's shirt. Through the windshield of the car Jack had borrowed from a used vehicle lot, he could see the Brumgan town of Penance City laid out in front of them. Its ugly color scheme, thankfully, was shrouded by the darkness of night and the city's mediocre streetlight system. Three miles straight ahead, its lights reflected against the low clouds was the spaceport where some of the enemy forces were even now being gathered together. Draco swiveled his head around, lifting his eyes over the back of Jack's shirt. Directly behind the car, rising over the low houses around it like a breaking ocean wave, was the tall ceramic wall that surrounded the Chukuk family estate. There were some very unpleasant memories tied up with that wall and the evil people who hid behind it. Dracos could imagine how Jack must be feeling right now as the memories of his brief time as a Chukuk slave were forced back upon him. Dracos? Jack's thought flowed into the Kadah's mind along the strange telepathic link the two of them had somehow developed. You okay? Yes! Dracos replied. Why do you ask? You're twitching your tail against the back of my knee, Jack told him. I thought maybe you were nervous. Dracos hadn't even realized he'd been doing that. My apologies, he said, bringing his tail to a halt. No problem, Jack assured him. It tickled, that's all. In the distance behind them, Dracos caught a flicker of reflected streetlight from the gate set into the white wall. The gate's opening again, he said aloud. Got it. Jack said, picking up the portable sensor he'd brought from the SNA and pressing it against the side window. Man, how many soldiers have they got in there, anyway? Well, we've had around 300 come through here, if that helps any. Alice and Kana's voice came from the comm clip attached to Jack's left shirt collar. Yes, thank you. I can do basic math, Jack growled. You want to keep it down? Relax. They can't possibly hear me, Allison said. Her tone managed somehow to be reassuring and sarcastic at the same time. We're all the way up at the top of the hangar in one of the loading crane supports. Good, Jack said tartly. Keep it down anyway. They'll be all right, Dracos telepathically assured him. I know, Jack spoke back. But the boy's words couldn't hide his tension, especially since it was the same tension Dracos himself was feeling because it should be him and Jack skulking around the Chukuk family's main shuttle hangar. It should be him and Jack watching the Brumgan mercenaries gathering for transport to the ambush point. It shouldn't be Allison and Tanine. Especially not Tanine. The young female Kadah was intelligent and likable, and she'd certainly shown herself willing to put herself at risk for Dracos and his people. But she'd spent most of her life as little more than an animal. Her transformation to full, sentient being was less than two months old. She still needed more learning and experience before she was ready to be for even a normal Kadah life. And the circumstances she and Allison were in right now were anything but normal. Restlessly, Draco slashed his tail. He should have put all four feet down right from the start and insisted that he and Jack take this part of the plan. The problem was that Allison was just as stubborn as Dracos was. And unfortunately, she'd also had logic on her side. She and Tanim had already successfully opened one of the Kadah Shantine safes, and that experience was worth more than any coaching that Allison could give Jack. Even Jack had admitted that. 
and to be fair, she had proved she was capable of handling herself. But all the logic in the universe didn't help. Dracos's emotional core was still tied up in knots of frustration and concern. Here they come, Jack said. Looks like just three vans in this convoy. Uncle Verge? Ready, Jack lad. The voice of the SNA's computerized personality came from the comm clip. The first van reached their position. Jack held the sensor steady against the window as it rolled past, followed closely by his two companions. Okay, he reported as the vehicle's taillights continued down the dimly lit street. Uncle Verge? Mm, first one seems to be all personnel, huh? Uncle Verge said slowly as the computer sifted through the data Jack's sensor had sent it. Mm, looks like your standard 15 armed Brumgas, yeah? Dracos grimaced. Allison's theory was that the Patrick Chukuk's role in this conspiracy was to supply Brumgan soldiers to crew the ships that would be attacking the Kadah and Shantine refugees. Apparently, she'd been correct. The Patrick Chukuk was donating the soldiers and crews. Arthur Neverland, once chairman of the board of the megacorporation Braxton Universis, was supplying the planning. Later, when the Kadan and Shantine were all dead, he would probably also provide the marketing system they would use to sell the technology from the looted refugee ships. The Velaga, deadly enemies from the Kadan and Shantine's own far distant part of the galaxy, were providing their horrible and unstoppable death weapon. That left only the attack ships themselves. Presumably, Colonel Maximus Frost of the Malison Ring mercenaries would be supplying those and all that the unsuspecting refugees had standing between them and genocide was Jack, Dracos, Allison, and Tanine. Two young humans and two Kada, And a single month of time. Mm, bingo, huh? Uncle Verge's voice cut into Dracos's thoughts. Our second van has five armed Brumgas, plus one very big chunk of metal, yeah? Dracos felt Jack's muscles tighten beneath him. How big? the boy asked. A little shorter than you and quite a bit wider, huh? Uncle Verge said. And I'm getting an unknown on the particular alloy, yeah? That's it, Allison said positively. That's the safe. Dracos lifted his head again to look at the van's retreating taillights. Each of his advance team's four ships had had one of those safes aboard, a safe that contained the location of their planned rendezvous with the incoming refugee fleet. But Neverland's ambush of the team had killed all the Kadah and Shantine except Dracos, leaving all four safes in his hands. Two had been wrecked when Neverland's men attempted to open them. Allison, under threat of her life, had opened the third for them. Three safes down, only one, only one still left. And the final safe had at last been brought out from behind the protection of the white wall and was heading toward the hangar where Allison and Tanim were waiting. I don't sound too eager, Uncle Verge warned. The third van has another 15 Brumgas, see? Not a problem, Allison said. I've got enough soap warmest canisters planted to blanket the whole hangar. I just need to make sure all three vans are inside before I trigger them. Just make sure they don't have gas masks on before you do it, Jack warned. You want to walk me through it just to make sure I do it right? Allison asked tartly. Relax, will you? I know what I'm doing. I hope so, Jack muttered as he set the sensor on the seat beside him and started the car. They'll be all right, Dracos reassured him telepathically as the boy pulled out into the Penance City traffic. We'll be only a few minutes behind this last group. If there's trouble, we'll be in position to help. Sure, Jack passed back. Help me watch for cops, will you? I'm going to see if I can get a little more speed out of this crate. There was a distant, muted thunk across the hangar from where Tanim and Allison crouched on the wide crane supports. The large doors on the north wall began to roll up. This should be them, Allison murmured. Tanim didn't answer. Her heart was beating rapidly, a cold sense of dread twisting like morning chill through her. Very soon now, the waiting would be over. And she was terrified. She'd been in dangerous situations before, certainly. Several of them, in fact. 
but never had she found herself facing the sheer numbers of brumgas wandering restlessly around the hangar floor below them. There were twenty-three of the aliens. Tanim had counted them five times. All of them carrying guns and wearing thick body armor. If Uncle Verge was right, the vans outside those opening doors carried another thirty-five of the aliens. You all right? Allison's soft voice asked into her thoughts. With an effort, Tanim lifted her silver eyes from all those guns and focused on Allison's calm face. An odd thought ran through Tanim's mind. A girl of Allison's mere fourteen years had no business being so calm in the middle of this much danger. Yes, I'm fine, she said, trying to keep her voice from shaking. The waiting's always the hardest part, Allison told her. But try to relax. If, those, if this goes down like it's supposed to, neither of us will have to do any fighting. And if it doesn't go down like it's supposed to? Tanim wondered. But there was no point in bringing that up. The doors below finished opening and three vans pulled inside. They rolled past the million Brumgas and pulled up behind the two shuttles waiting by the much larger doors at the south end of the hangar. There had been ten such shuttles when Tanim and Allison had first arrived, which had left the hangar in pairs as each group of new passengers arrived and was loaded aboard. At first, Tanim had hoped the shuttles might provide the answer to their problem. Allison had brought along the transmitting device that Colonel Frost had used to track the SNA to Rose Scrovey, and Tanim had hoped she and Allison could plant it aboard one of the shuttles and find the refugee rendezvous point that way. But Allison had explained that the shuttles would simply be taking the Brumgas to another ship or group of ships waiting out in deep space. Those ships would then continue on while the shuttles returned to Brumadum. Across the hangar, the doors closed again with another thunk. On the floor below, the van doors opened and the Brumgan soldiers began filing out. Okay, Allison said, getting a grip on a remote trigger. Here we go. Flipping up the protective cover, she pressed the button. Nothing happened. Allison? Tanim asked anxiously, looking down at the Brumgas still filing out of their vans. It's okay, Allison assured her. This is a Type 4 Sopor. Takes longer to start working, but also keeps them asleep longer after the mist dissipates. Tanim flicked her tail. Certainly, Allison ought to know how her own weapons worked. And then, all across the hangar, the Brumgas went limp and collapsed onto the floor. See, Allison said as she pulled off her full helmet gas mask and tossed a coil of, pulled on her full helmet gas mask and tossed a coil of rope over the edge of the track. Here we go. Stay here until I call you. Getting a grip on the rope, she rolled off the support and started sliding down. Tanim watched her go, scratching her claws nervously against the metal of the track support. If the Brumgans down there were faking... But no one moved or opened fire, and a few seconds later, Allison was safely down. Drawing her, small, drawing her small corvine pistol from her holster, the girl dropped the backpack off her shoulder and pulled it open. Clear, her muffled voice came from the comm clip fastened to Tanim's ear. I'll get the mixed star started. Allison headed toward the middle van. Tanim watched her go, thinking about her mixed star safe-cracking computer. She'd seen the device in action, and it still amazed her that such a powerful device could be concealed inside a belt and a pair of shoes. Allison reached the van, peered into the open door, and disappeared inside. Tanim! Dracos' voice came softly. Are you all right? I'm fine! Tanim answered him. The soap armist seems to have worked properly! Keep an eye on the Brumgas anyway, Draco said. Watch for twitching or movements like someone might make in their sleep. If you see anything like that, let us know immediately. They'll be fine, Allison said before Tanine could answer. Okay, the mixed star's running. I'll go find a spot for the tracer. She reappeared from the van and jogged over to the rear of the nearest shuttle, ducking beneath its engine section. This was the part that Tinim still didn't quite understand. The tracer would do them no good attached to the shuttle. Jack, Allison, and Dracos all knew that. So, presumably, would Colonel Frost. 
Yet Allison seemed to think Frost might not think Jack and Allison knew that. She tried to explain that Frost might therefore believe that was the reason why she and Tanim had invaded the hangar this way. It would be simpler if they never knew Allison and Tanim had been here at all, but Tanim had to admit that was probably impossible, not with the Brumgas having been put to sleep this way. There was so much she still had to learn. Allison! Jack's voice snapped with sudden urgency in Tanim's ear. More traffic heading your way! I thought Uncle Verge said there was only 25 vans at the Chukuk grounds, Allison said. These aren't vans, they're cars, Jack gritted out. Four of them loaded to the gills with humans. And, Dracos put in tauntly, Frost and Neverland are among them!